Grab your notes, and uh, we're going to transition. We are in week three of a really important series where where we've named the series, What Am I Here For? We're doing several things all at once, kind of like spiritual jujitsu, okay? That came out better at 8.30, but anyhow, here's what we're doing. Um, We are kind of slowing the RPMs down for those of us who are wanting in on a broader conversation about some of the most important questions that we ask ourselves. Some of, sometimes those who are more trained say the existential questions of life. We're asking ourselves some of these deeper, more profound questions. And we're, we're kind of, uh, we, we started with a kind of provocative sort of question. And I want to give you the question if you're taking notes. Here it is. What if life, just for a moment, really isn't about you? Now, I know that's weird. Call us weird. Call us irresponsible. Call us crazy. What if life isn't about you? Let's just entertain that for a moment. This is provocative because we are living in a culture right now where it it just seems like all the arrows are pointing in on our own lives. I was... um, after we learned of this, trans, this forced transition, don't you love forced transition? After we learned about this, um, it, it, it happened all in one day. And, and to be honest, I was, out of, I was out of words by the afternoon. You ever run out of words? And I, and I thought, you know, it was late. It was a late, uh, I didn't get to go to lunch. And I thought, I'm out of words. I'm just going to go to lunch by myself somewhere sit, stuff myself in a corner of a restaurant, stare into the corner of the wall, just drool and just kind of think about where my life is turning into right now. Come on, y'all work with me just a little bit. Okay. And I was doing that and and I was just thinking about all this stuff, all this transition, like Lord, all this stuff's going on. And there was this girl, this young, young woman who was sitting not far from me and she was apparently out of her words too and she was there by herself. She was having lunch and, and I was just watching. I'm kind of a people person so I was watching. My girls tell me sometimes, don't watch too much, it's creepy, but I was watching. And, and here's a weird thing, like the waitress came and gave her her water and when, when the waitress gave her water and she walked away, she took a picture of the water. Okay, right? And then a few minutes later, she brought a table setting and she took a picture of the table setting. And then she brought her lunch, and she took a picture of her lunch. And I watched this girl. She probably took like 15 pictures of herself. And I was tempted to run over there and get in the picture. <laughs> but I thought, that would be creepy. I don't want to do that. But, but it, just sort of, it just sort of reminded me that, that literally this is where we are right now in our culture. We're just kind of focused on ourselves. And so we entered into this whole conversation with this idea that what if life really isn't about you? What if life doesn't really start and end in you? What if life begins and ends with God? And so that's where we've been starting this conversation. What if life really, just all of us, like I love what Keith said a little bit ago, where we just kind of push the door open a little bit. And what if we all consider, just for a moment, just for grins, what if life actually begins and ends with God? And, and we started here because um, we thought of, and then when we, when we got to this part, we thought of a little, a, a little verse of scripture that the, the wisdom writer in the Older Testament writes in Proverbs chapter 11, where he, he made this observation, a life devoted just to things is a dead life. It's like a stump. But a God-shaped life is a flourishing tree. So we got, we got in on the dance floor by just making that simple observation. What if just for a moment we just kind of stopped all the craziness going on around us and we said, you know what, life is not about me. Life begins and ends with God. That's, that's, a, that's a tremendous life hack if you want to have a life hack. And we're all we're, we're on this part in our world right now where when we see something going on in the world and it looks successful, it looks good, we tend to want to know what's the secret. I was out uh, recently, I was mowing my yard, and, and I, I don't I don't, I don't want to be too prideful, but my yard is, it's kind of perfect. <laughs> I mean, come on. 
It's kind of perfect. I, and I was out here mowing, mowing the yard, and there was this guy that uh, was walking by. Uh, I didn't know him, knew in our neighborhood. And, you know, this kind of thing happens to me all the time. You know, I'm mowing. And, and, uh, and he, he, like, he did this, hey. And I was like, hi. And he goes, stop. And I was like, hi. <laughs> and he said, no, stop. And so I let the mower like stop. And, he, and when the sound died out, he goes, what's the secret? And I mean, of course, right? I mean, <laughs> what's, what's the secret? And I said, what? You know, I, I knew what he, where he was going, but I was like, what's the secret to what? And he goes, what's the secret to your lawn, man? Your lawn is nice. Now, here, here was a moral dilemma right there. Because in our neighborhood, we do this thing every month called home of the month. Yeah, you're tracking with me, I see. And I thought, now I could tell him my secret, but then he might win the award. So I started making things up and telling him all kinds of crud. I actually didn't do that. Some of you right now are going, man, I'm in the wrong church. This guy needs therapy. But um, we, we ask ourselves, this is kind of what we do, right? Like we want to know if somebody's doing well financially. Hey, what's the secret? Somebody, somebody is good with their physical fitness. Hey, can you tell me the life hack? Can you, you know, we do all of this. And, and here's the thing. In this arena, we're coming in and we're talking about, we're talking about faith. And here's what we just want to say to everybody. We want to say this. Just for a moment, pretend that life isn't about you that life actually begins and ends with God. We talked about the secret. I was doing my devotions recently in my back porch and I ran across these words from the Apostle Paul. And the Apostle Paul said this. He goes, you know what? I've learned actually to be content whatever circumstances. He said, I know what it is to be in need and boy, he, did he. And I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned, look at the language he uses. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, living in plenty or living in want, I can do this through him who gives me strength. This is just the Apostle Paul acknowledging this idea. All of life begins and ends with this creator God. And so we've been building on this truth. And, and if you're with us last week, Jessica helped us in understanding that we are planned for God's pleasure. You have been created to live in a dynamic, real-time, personal, transformational life with the living God of the universe. That's what we've been created for. And this week, I want to move the ball forward a little bit, and I want to teach on this concept. We are, say it with me, we are formed for God's family. So what, what if one of the bigger purposes in life is the idea, is, is this reality that you've literally been created to connect in a family of other believers and grow in your faith. I want to explore this. Um, Paul, again, mentioning him, he writes in the book of Ephesians uh, in uh, a very interesting observation, and we're going to explore it. So I'm going to invite you to stand. Thank you so much for that. And I want to read to you Paul's words in, in the book of Ephesians, Chapter 2, beginning in verse 19. Now pay attention because we're going we're gonna to dig into this verse today. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 19. He says, so, or consequently, all right? He's talking about being alive in Christ. And then he says, okay, because you're alive in Christ, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but you're fellow citizens with God's people and also members, look at this phrase, members of his household, Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone, like in the very center. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Okay, so this is the word of God for the people of God. We say, thanks be to God. You may be seated. 
Let's, let's pray together around this. Such cool stuff I want to point out. Let's pray. God, we, uh, we, we come into your presence this morning. We're thankful for the space to, that we can gather and, and now be in a mindset, now be in a posture of learning. Now, Lord, by your, the power of your Holy Spirit, we know you're here. And I just ask in faith that you might give to each of us in this room and to each of us wherever we are listening online, worshiping uh, in line, uh, online, a part of our worshiping community there. Give us the ability, Lord, to really lean into this truth, to see it for what it is, as something powerful and transformational that could have deep, deep meaning for our lives, God. There's so many questions going on in our culture, so many things. And we just pray, Lord, that you might Lead us to your truth, for we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. And everybody said, amen. All right, let's, let's kind of orient around this passage of Scripture. So first of all, this is Paul's letter to the what really, we should think of it this way, the churches in Ephesus. Now, letters back then, the word actually is epistle. So if you see the, the general epistle to the Ephesians, that's Paul's letter to the churches in Ephesus. Now, here's what I want you to know if you're taking notes. It's what's referred to as a general epistle. Paul sometimes wrote pastoral epistles, like when Paul was writing to Timothy. That's like a pastoral epistle, pastoral letter. A general epistle means this. It's for all of us. So all of us in the room, we get to participate in what he's saying. And Paul says some interesting things. First of all, we'd want to know this. He's writing around, we think scholars think around AD 60, some, somewhere there. And he's, it's a general epistle. And he's writing, listen to this, he's writing to strengthen believers by taking a moment to explain the nature and the purpose of the church. So the whole, the whole letter is to help us understand why church why is this important? You ever think about the church sometimes and you go, God, could you not have come up with a better way to get your redemptive work done in the world? That, I mean, is this, is this the best way? And, 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 and the Spirit of God would say, this is the way I'm going to do it. So we all have to orient ar- around that. And, and there's something really important happening here. Two things. First of all, here's, here's what's important. Number one. Gentiles are included and invited to the party. Woohoo. So if you're here right now and you're not, you're not Jewish, this is, this is Paul reminding all of the early churches, hey, Gentiles are welcome. Isn't that great? Thank God, all right. Here, here's the, that's one thing he's saying, and here's the thing that I want to key in on this morning, the other thing that he's doing. He is elevating the conversation and the language to include this idea that this whole thing, this, is a family. It's a family. And here's what I want you to know. Back then, when he wrote that, that was, to say that was radical is almost an understatement. Uh, think about think about how how our Jewish brothers and sisters oriented towards the faith. All of this sacred documents like the Pentateuch that referred to God as either Yahweh or Elohim, they would never say those words out loud because God was holy. They would only write them. So there's all this profound respect, which there should be, right? I want to say this here, right? Jesus is not your homeboy, all right? So there should be respect. But Paul is saying inside of this respect and honor, the church is a family. And, and this, began, this began to be the, the language that disseminated through the entire New Testament. Let me show you another verse of Scripture. John the Beloved was writing one time. Let's just move on to that, uh, the verse in 1 John 1, 3. And he says it this way. He says, see what great love the Father. First of all, super radical. Father? 
See what great love the Father has lavished on us. Look at this, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us, uh, know us is that it did not know him. This is the language of the New Testament. We're a part of a family. And that's an, awesome, that's an awesome truth. Isn't that an awesome truth? Here's what I would tell you. Mostly. Mostly it's awesome. Why? Because every one of us has a family. You're still not with me. Everybody has a family, and family is complicated. Now, are you with me? Yes. Right? How many, I, I, was, I was meeting with a, a guy in our church recently, and we were tracking some issues. He reached out and said, hey, I'll talk to my pastor. I said, all right, let's, let's go and have some coffee. We're having coffee together. And, and I sensed something was going on. I said, so, well, tell me, about, tell me about your family. And this is what he said to me. He goes, you know, family he did this thing, you know. He goes, well, it's, it's complicated. How many of you would self-identify and go, family's complicated, right? If, if you're not aware that family's complicated, um, have a significant event like a birth, a death, an anniversary, a wedding, something like that, and you learn real quickly in that moment, family is complicated, Right? And if that doesn't make you think that, I want to tell you right now where you're sitting, right now, we are 102 days away from Thanksgiving. Now you're tracking with me, right? Every Thanksgiving, right? Who are we inviting? Are they coming? Will they bring him? Can we invite, can we invite them, but maybe not her? And here's what I always remind people in the room. Some of those hymns and hers are y'all. I'm somebody's him or her. My younger brother's like, is Beth can come. Is, does Dale have to come? I mean, that, right? Family, family is complicated. And uh, I want to show you a picture of a guy. Uh, this is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, was, he was a Lutheran pastor that lived in Germany during World War II. Not a great place to live. And uh, he was part, he was known as a German dissident, and he spoke against the, res he was part of the resistance. So he was, he was pushing against Nazism. And it's kind of a sad story, it really is, because a deep and devout man of God and was speaking truth to power, and it was right near the end of World War II, and they captured him. And they sent Dietrich Bonhoeffer to a, uh, to a uh, concentration camp. And then they hung him for being a follower of Jesus, really. But while he was in uh, prison, one of, the, one of the books that he wrote was a book entitled, I'll show you the picture of it, it's called Life Together. I actually have this book. It's in my library that's rotting in the building just over here. <laughs> um, but anyhow, side note, uh, side note. But anyhow, here's, here's, what, uh, here's what Dietrich Bonhoeffer writes. He said, all of us enter into relationships with our own particular ideals and dreams of what genuine family or genuine community might actually look like. And then he says this. But God's grace quickly frustrates all of our dreams. And we experience the great disillusionment with others and with sometimes even Christians in general. And if we're fortunate, even with ourselves, it's bound to overwhelm us as surely God desires to lead us into a deeper understanding of what genuine community actually looks like. So here's the thing. What's he pointing to? You and I are formed for a kind of community that by the very nature of our connecting in that community fosters authentic faith 
and deeper awareness of who God actually is. Now that's a profound thing. And, and, and so it, it partners well, if you will, it pairs well with the idea that you are cre- like, like this, you're created for this kind of community. It, it's, it's a lie from the pit of hell to, to believe or to operate in this idea that Christianity is a solo sport. It's not. And in fact, here's, here's what I, I want us to think about. I want us to think about that if we're formed for God's, uh, if we're literally formed to live in a community of faith with other people, I have learned as a pastor that kind of community really creates four things. I want to give them to you if you're taking notes. First is this, which is really important, right? It helps us know we can belong. Say that with me. It helps us know we can belong. Here's here's what I, I think. All of us need to learn when we think about things like life and faith and the intersection of these things, that we, that we all belong. We all belong. We're all children of God and persons of great worth. And, and you think about it. Here's, here's Paul. He's teaching us this. He's saying, hey, Gentiles are part of the family. Uh, he's saying, we, we, we can all... We're all part of it, and and, and he starts using this language that's super provocative and radical at the time. God is a father, and we're brothers and sisters, and we're all part of a family. We all have to learn that we belong. I was thinking about that this week, right, because so many of us uh, took our kids to school, and some were in new schools, and, and every year we have educators and principals in the room right now. And, you know, here's, we're, we're all learning, and, and one of the things we're, all, we're trying to help our kids understand is that, is that we, they belong. It's sort of the biggest thing. Kids get out of the car, and they're walking to class. I remember this week I was reminiscing with a friend. I remember taking our older daughter to H.L. Johnson for the first time. And it was back in the day when you could walk all the way to the, all the, way to the room. And go all the way to the children's room. And we go, went over to the room, and, and, and I, I took her. She had, it was so cute. You know, she had her little lunch box, and she had, all, she had a little thing called a trapper keeper. How many of y'all remember those things? Right. She had her trapper. I mean, she was like, it, she was in it. And like, she walked into the room, and, and then I stood there, and I watched her. And I kept watching her. And finally, the teacher came and shut the door. <laughs> and I kept watching her. And I was standing with this other guy that lives in our neighborhood. He's moved now, but he's this big guy. He was, he was kind of built like me. He's big, rock, muscular kind of guy. And, and we were standing there, and he had his son. I had my daughter. We were in there, and we're all kind of choked up at each other. And we're kind of just having this moment. Finally, the, literally, the teacher comes to the door, and she goes, guys, it's time for you all to go home now. It's okay. You know? And we're all learning we can belong. And that's, that's something we need to learn over and over and over again. We joke all the time around church. We have friends and loved ones that say, man, I'd come to church, right? But if I came to church, say it with me, the walls will fall down, right? And we all joke about that. But, but remember, what are we coming out of? We're coming out of a religious history where you don't even say God's name. Just write it because he's holy. And we wonder all the time, this perfect, holy God, and and we know that about God, and then here's what we know about ourselves. We know ourselves. And we need to know that we can belong. When I was starting in ministry, uh, we were back in a tradition where they, they just appointed you as a church, where you would go as a pastor. My parents were living here in Palm Beach County. My dad had just retired. And they were living the life, you know. And, and, and I called them one afternoon and said, hey, we got our call. We're gonna, I'm going to pastor in Stewart. It's a little north. And my, my folks were so great. They were like, tell us the church. We'll go incognito. And so they went, they, went, they went the next Sunday, and then my dad called me in the afternoon. I'll never forget it. It was back when we had called. Remember when you would have like a phone card, 
and like I would call, like I called home and, and I was talking to my dad and my, my dad said, well, we went this morning, son. I said, tell me about it. He goes, well, it's kind of, kind of different, kind of different. He says, very traditional. I said, okay, I, I, I can do traditional. He goes, the pastor you're going to be working with, they wear robes and stoles and all that kind of stuff. And I was like, okay, it's going to be a little different, but I, 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 I can do that. And he goes, and when he preached, he climbed up into this granite pulpit that looked down onto the people and he just spoke from this spot and he goes that's what you're gonna have to do and then my dad said it he goes do they actually know you (laughs) I was like what is that all about like what are you trying to say and I remember when I got there I I moved in I moved my books into my office so same books that are rotting in that building right over there (laughs) and and I and I and I and I walked in I, I walked in from the office and I walked into the sanctuary and, and there it was, the granite pulpit. And I walked in through the, the lobby and this is literally a sign that was in the lobby. It said this, the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth keep silent before him. And I thought, my God, I'm in the wrong place. <laughs> We're all trying to wonder whether we belong. Here's what I want you to know. You belong. You belong. Look at what the psalmist writes in Psalm 68. God sets the lonely into families. That's the kind of God we have. So if you're here today and you need a family, you need a place where you can be loved and belong, this is for you. But it's not just that. It not only is a place where we belong, it's a place where we begin the Christian life, right? Here's the thing thing that I love about Community of Hope. So many of you who are here, so many people in our church, a large number of people in our church have never been to church till they came here to this church. So I'm always thinking as, you know, your founding pastor, don't screw this up, Dale, because this is like people are forming opinions about church when they come to community of hope, and that's important, but we begin the Christian life. Oftentimes, this is a great picture of baptism, and, and this summer, we were having our, we had like, I think it was like 70 people that got baptized at the beach this summer, and we, we, we had them identify, look at this right here, that's just an awesome picture. Here's Pastor Ephraim, Pastor Mitch, here's, um, TJ and some other dude, I don't know. And, uh, and then um, here, here, look at this. It's just awesome. We're beginning the Christian experience. And what's so powerful about a moment like this, right, is we, we just, we, we get to come in and we get to kind of knock around a little bit. And we get to learn some things and we can begin to apply them to our lives. Something deeply transformational is taking place right in this moment. And then thirdly, though, I want us to understand, it's also a place when we're formed for God's family that helps us grow in our belief. Now, belief is a really, really important thing. And sometimes I just want to point out that sometimes I think we have the wrong idea about belief. In fact, let me show you this verse of Scripture. It's really important. We're familiar with it. Let's read it out loud. One of the most famous Scriptures in all the Bible, right? Ready? Go. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. What does this verse really teach us? Here's what it teaches us. Maybe you should write it down. That all of us are created by God, but you have some choice in in becoming a child of God. And that's what the church traditionally has understood as being born again. Right? We're, We're all created by God. You know, just as in a natural world, we can, we could be sired, so to speak, from a man and a woman. It's a whole different thing for that man or woman to be a father and the woman to be a mother 
to us. Different. John was writing, I think, and he said it in John chapter 1, and I believe it's in verse 12. Look at this. For all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, look at this. He gave them then the right to become children of God. Children not born of natural descent, Children not born of a human decision, children not born of a husband's will, but born of the living God. So if you've not done that this morning, maybe that's the, your play, that's your move, is to say, Lord, I've, I've never said, hey, I want to be one of your children. Come into my heart, God, and begin to help me orient my life toward you. Belief is an important thing. Sometimes we just throw that word around. One, one author that I was reading from recently said this about belief. Said, those who believe they believe in God, those who believe they believe in God, but do so without passion of heart, do so without anguish of mind, do so without the uh, occasional uncertainty and even doubt, and even at times despair, believe only in the idea of God. And not actually in God himself. Powerful. I've in my own life tried to break belief down around three things. One, one is what, what, what I call like public conviction. Which is we, we say sometimes we say things we, that we believe. We're only really saying them so that other people think we believe them. Is that what's happening right now in the political arena? Yeah, I said it. <laughs> Send your notes to Trevor at communityofhope.church. Okay? Uh, I, I remember this funny story. I have to just share this. It was this story of this church, this older church that was trying to orient around computers. So they took all the sacred liturgies and they put them on computer. Now they could print their own out. And so they could print like weddings and funerals and personalize them in a way. And so, like, they, they did a funeral. They printed it out. They did a funeral for a woman named Mary, and it worked great. And they went back and said, okay, this is great. And then they had another funeral in the church. It was for a precious woman. Her name was Edna. And so what they did is they went to the computer. This is what you could do. They took out Mary. Everywhere it says Mary and put in Edna. And then they go to the funeral. And then there's that moment in the funeral where the pastor asks everybody to stand up, and they're going to recite the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And Jesus Christ, the only Son of the Lord, is conceived of the virgin Edna. <laughs> and, and, and they just read it, and they were, they were like, I think I believe this. It doesn't sound right, but I kind of believe it. Right? That was good. What? That was a good one. Um, there's, there's, there's private conviction. Watch real closely here. Private conviction is the stuff you tell yourself you believe, but you might not actually believe it. That's a flagrant foul in the church today. You know, you know what real belief is? The kind of belief where John was saying, for God so loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, it's not public conviction, it's not private conviction. Watch this, it's our core conviction. And you know what our core conviction is? It's the stuff we actually practice. It's the stuff you make mental notes about. Like gravity. You don't get up every day and go, I believe in gravity. You just, you just trust that gravity is something to believe in. That's the kind of belief John is writing about with respect to Jesus. And, and here's what he said. You build mental maps around that kind of stuff. So if, if I really believe in Jesus, let me, let me push the envelope here. If I really believe in Jesus, what does it mean? It shows up in what I say. It shows up in what I do. 
it shows up in what I refrain from doing. Let me want talk about that. It, it shows up in what I practice. Now that's really what you believe. So if we're formed for a family, that, that idea literally means it helps us know we belong. It helps us begin the Christian experience. Uh, it helps us come to believe as a core conviction. And then lastly, it helps us become like Christ. Because you know what Christian actually means, right? It means little Christ. We are incrementally, every day, every moment, more and more like Jesus. That's my prayer. I got a long way to go. But that's my prayer. You got a long way to go. Make it your prayer. In the coming weeks, we're going to talk specifically about what that looks like. Let's pray. Lord, help us. First of all, first of all, just even thank you. Thank you, Lord. We've been formed to be a part of a family. So thank you for thank you for this place. Thank you for this community. I, I pray that that every single person who walks through these doors, regardless of what they practice or believe, knows they belong. And they are loved by a God who loved them first. Thank you for that. We give you this moment in Jesus' name. And everybody said, I think that's the prayer in the room, right? The prayer in the room really is saying yes to God. Uh, it's stepping away from life being about you and understanding deep in our heart that all of life begins and ends with God. And we can know this God, even Jesus, the Christ. Lord, that's our prayer, and we just pray that you might help us come to deeper belief, core conviction kind of belief around these truths as we build on this truth of this weekend. For we pray together in Jesus' name and everybody said, amen. I have friends here that would love to pray for you. If you have a special prayer request, come this way before you go that way. Go in his grace. We'll see you next weekend.